Okay, welcome back to another author interviews at Crystal Lake. And our guest today is author Bill Mullen, who's uh, written The Thing in the Wind. And I'm going to turn it over to him now and let him introduce himself and what he writes. Take it away. Hey, everybody. I'm, uh, as mentioned, Bill Mullen. Um, and I mostly write horror. Uh, the Thing in the Wind is a, a horror novel. Um, I did delve a little bit into uh, thriller and, and spy um, genre a little bit with the first novel, Red Nocturne. But um, I think I think from here on, it'll probably just be horror. <laughs> okay, so um, give everyone a quick overview about your new book coming up, uh, The Thing in the Wind. Yeah, so it takes place in uh, mostly in northern Canada, a uh, very desolate region. Um, of northern Saskatchewan, and our protagonist, the main character, Gwen, uh, you know, she's just settling in her new home in uh, Yellowknife in the Northwest Territories. Things seem to be going pretty well, and then she gets news that her mother is missing, and the uh, RCMP, they're not able to come up with any answers, so she and her father and a few others uh, form a search party just to go out and try to find some answers. Uh, see if there's anything that they can find that the police didn't find. So while they're out in this wilderness, uh, this kind of unknown terrain, um, they discover some something lurking out there uh, in the in the forest and uh, have to deal with that. And do all of them make it? Do none of them make it? I don't know. Well, I do, but you don't yet. <laughs> yeah um um yeah i think for things lurking in the forest always make for a good horror horror book so what were your inspirations for writing the novel well i've actually always been fascinated with very desolate regions and uh you know northern canada and, and you know the yellow knife northern uh, the athabasca region i don't know it's always been intriguing to me so kind of delving into researching the area and some of the lore that's uh, found in the area. Started getting ideas swirling. And then from there, um, some parts of, of, of Gwen, the main character, started kind of coming to life. And I, I thought pairing the two would work uh, pretty well. And I think it did. So just being able to really get immersed in, in really the setting. Now, the setting itself kind of plays a role as you know as a character in the novel so it was just enjoyable because you know even in my own reading I, I love reading about uh you know tales that take place in these desolate regions like you know, the willows by Algernon blackwood and um, practically any horror story that takes place in places like antarctica so it was it was kind of fun to to give that one a go so that, that really inspired it uh, tied in of course with the lore uh of, of the region which if I go too deep into that, that'll give too many things away. <laughs> okay, so how did you use this the setting in creating a haunting atmosphere for the book? I mean, tell us a little bit about your process there. Well, as it was Lovecraft that basically uh, tells us that you know one of our oldest and deepest fears is fear of the unknown, and it's in a setting like this where not many humans have actually gone, it, it leaves it, you know, a very uncharted, uh, unknown region. So that in and of itself, I think evokes a lot of fear. Um, and then of course, dealing with the elements, I mean, that's a, it's a harsh terrain. Um, you know, they're there in uh, early winter, uh, late fall. So it's that transitional period. So dealing with the elements and also dealing with, uh, dealing dealing with the fears of you know what what could be just beyond the tree line right and it's not only you know potential supernatural fears but the what the wildlife in in the region is also uh predatory and people have to worry about that and one little slip up and you know one you could die right it could either be hypothermia it could be an animal attack it could be you know something uh something supernatural and um but I think even more so, it, it's there's that sense of isolation. Like if something does go wrong, or even if I, you know, hurt my leg, we're many miles from any help. 
there's no cell service out here. It's kind of, you know, we're on our own. And so I, I think the setting really just connects with everything that they do and mentally and physically. And, uh, and then finally, of course, you have to worry about the others in the party. How are they handling all of those stressors and do, do any of them snap? Uh, and, you know, how would you handle that? So I think overall the, you know, that, that, that overall atmosphere kind of attacks every element of, of the characters. I think it worked. Okay. So tell us a little bit about the main character. What's her personality? What kind of emotional <clears throat> journey does she go down? Yeah. So Gwen, um, she uh, lived, her father's in the military. So she's uh, was constantly moving around uh, when she was younger. So she was never really able to feel rooted in any place. And <clears throat> when she went to college, uh, it's also where she met her husband. And um, he got the job up in Yellowknife. And so when they go up there, she's really tying in with nature up there. Uh, they live right on uh, Great Slave Lake. Um, you know, the harsh weather and, and the, the desolation in the area, she's really embracing that. And um, she's kind of finding this place as a, a good place to set down her roots. And she wants to stay. You know, that's not really the, the kind of place that's always easy to make the transition to, right? Uh, you know, parts of the year, it's all daylight. Other parts of the year, it's all night. And uh, add in the weather uh, conditions as well and the sparse population. But she's embracing all that. But her husband is, you know, he's he's not transitioning well. So she can kind of see this conflict coming up. And what I really like about her is she kind of comes from a line, you know, her like her grandmother and mother. She's coming from a line of women who are kind of rebelling against a lot of the norms. Her grandmother uh, started to, it wasn't quite successful, but her mother uh, found a lot more success in doing it. And I think that kind of rebellious spirit is within her. And so she's kind of knowing that there's going to be a conflict coming up with um, with her husband about whether they can stay there or not. And um, her being, you know, very strong minded as she is, you know, she's like, it seems like if you can't handle it, you're just going to have to go. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I like that strength in her. And, um, and I think that also comes through when uh, when her father comes and you know, gives her the news about her mother. You know, she's very quick to say, well, I guess we're going to go and find some answers. There's no hesitation. And uh, that's what I like about her. You know, she she knows what she wants and she goes after it. And when there's obstacles in the way, she gets through those obstacles or tries to get through those obstacles rather than shying away from them. So, um, so I really like her character. Okay, so what about some of the secondary characters? Do any of them particularly stand out, or are there conf what kind of conflicts do they have with each other? That sort of thing. Well, one of the secondary characters, uh, his name is Baron. Uh, he's part of that part of the search party. We learn quite a bit about him and his life, and um, without giving too much away, he joins the search party for a very personal reason. Um, you know, due to uh, due to some circumstances that happen in the book, and there's a couple moments when he he might try and steal the show a little bit. Um, you know, he he goes through some pretty serious uh, emotional moments, and um, I, I think that readers will connect well with him because he's kind of he's kind of the opposite. Of, of Gwen uh, when it comes to that, uh, that independence. You know, he's somebody that is very happy, wants to settle down as well, but is willing to really give up a lot for, uh, for his partner. And I, I think that type of personality comes out and I think he can get overly emotional at times, which I think can kind of uh, grab the reader's attention away from, uh, from Gwen and, and a few other things happening uh, in the story. And um, 
And we learned a bit about Gwen's dad too. Uh, you know, again, he has kind of that military mind, um, kind of, you know, there's a mission to do and, you know, we're going to move forward and do it. And I think some of that mindset we kind of see in Gwen as well. So we can kind of see where she gets a little bit of, uh, of that, but, um, but I like those. We, we see that it mostly comes from her mother. Yeah, so, so what is the father daughter dynamic? Do they get along or is there little friction there? No, they, they get along. The, the main issue is that, um, he's often tied up with work. So they don't really, they don't really have a strong bond per se, but it, it's not for, uh, uh, what, what word am I looking for here? It's, it's not necessarily on purpose. It's just the circumstance. So I, I don't think there's any resentment there, but, um, but they care for each other. And I think it's a, it's a good, a good relationship. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So what's, uh, what's your favorite scene that you wrote in the book without giving spoilers? Yeah. So let's say a spoil free one is actually, it happens early on. Um, when we, uh, are when we meet Gwen's mother, uh, back when she was in, in high school and we kind of see that, that break that she makes when she kind of rebels against, uh, rebels against her parents, rebels kind of against the church and the school and all this stuff that she kind of feels is kind of indoctrinating her a little bit and trying to have her follow a certain path, uh, that kind of, kind of makes women second-class citizens. And she's basically like, oh, okay, no, I'm not going to do that. And kind of breaks away from that. Um, she finds uh, her mother's journals and, and starts learning that her mother tried to this rebellion and tried to kind of go her own way and it didn't work out. She also finds a copy of uh, Silent Spring, uh, a book by Rachel Carson that kind of started uh, the environmental movement. And she's heavily influenced by that. So as she starts kind of reading, uh, she finds this place in the in the backyard, uh, which is right on the line of a forest, goes into the forest a little bit and starts really getting in tune with nature and uh, kind of learning a lot about herself. And through this whole process, ends up having a sublime experience there, you know, realizing her own uh, insignificance and connection to nature and the cosmos and, and whatnot. And I think this is a big turning point that solidifies her, uh, her path to really get away from um, the ideas and, uh, and, and, and breaking away from that community. Uh, that community is actually in Tennessee and, you know, she graduates and immediately leaves and she never goes back. And, you know, I think that independent spirit, you know, we kind of learn how she gets it and, and that she actually does do something with that. And again, later on, we kind of see that, um, bleeding into Gwen. And so I really like that, that scene, um, where, you know, we, we do see that, yeah, there is no turning back here. You know, she's, she's not going to give in the way that her mother, uh, did. So, and then there's, you know, right at the end there, again, not really giving anything away, but um, something happens uh, to that special place in the forest. And I think that kind of highlights some of the subject matter that, that's been dealt with there, like the environmental concerns and, and whatnot. So I think it, I think it will hopefully speak to, uh, speak to the readers, especially those that I, you know, that care about the environment okay so what was the hardest scene for you to write in the book um probably well definitely the last 30 pages <laughs> <laughs> so i i knew what the last line of the book was going to be before i even wrote the first line but those last 30 pages i mean so many revisions and you know, I was like, well, I think this will work. And then it just became problematic. So I changed it and changed it again and changed it again. And then finally, with its, you know, current <laughs> and final uh, uh, draft of it, I'm pretty happy with it. But unlike the a lot of the book, 
that just kind of came along and had you know uh, not too many too many revisions that those last 30 pages just those are kind of difficult to get together <laughs> yeah sometimes it is hard to get all the the ducks in a row and the, get the ending right yeah. <laughs> okay so um what do you enjoy most about writing in the horror genre well in the horror I, i've always been a fan of horror even at a very young age i'm thankful that my parents allowed me to watch horror films when i was very young um and i think what i what i enjoy most about it is i like to uh i like to scare people i like to kind of evoke that uh, motion of fear and similar to how like a comedian wants to evoke laughter and, and joy and uh and whatnot um i don't know there's there's something that that kind of draws me to that, that emotion, right? And uh, I can have a lot of, you know, you can have a lot of fun with it. You know, when, mm -hmm. when somebody, you know, says, I lost a little bit of sleep last night because of that scene in the book, it's kind of like, oh, okay. Because I know that if I've watched a film or read a scene in a book and, you know, I'm having trouble sleeping one night, I'm like, ooh, that that really worked. That That's really uh, gripping me. And um I don't know. It, it, I think it's a difficult thing to do, and so when it, when you're able to do that, it can mean a lot. All right. So, so what do you struggle with in your writing in general? Do you have trouble with openings, dialogue, action scenes, endings? Clearly, endings. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say though, it's like within a book, there's two types of scenes that I tend to struggle with. Um, usually, if there's like a fight scene. Uh, or an intimate scene, because I usually approach those, and in, unless something very unique or significant happens during the scene, it feels like a pause in many ways. You know, if, if there's too many uh, descriptions of, well, he hit him in the face with his right hand, and and this happened and that happened, you know, sometimes even when I'm reading or even in film watching a, a scene, it's kind of like, Okay, they're fighting. You know what? What's the significant part here? It feels like a pause. So, I, I sometimes try not to put too much of that in uh, in any story I'm writing. I try to kind of limit it to maybe a paragraph or so because um, I don't know. It just it, it that that pause kind of bugs me sometimes. And uh, I guess the other way around that is to always, if you're going to have one, always have something unique or significant in there but because i think most people they know what a fight is and they, you know they know what a intimate scene is so um it uh i don't know it does seem to to pause things but yeah yeah i i do like to throw in weird stuff in some of my fight scenes i had one of my characters knock somebody out with a gnome so <laughs> see that would be perfect <laughs> something nice and unique anyway so uh this is a bit of a loaded question so who are some of your favorite authors oh um gosh i would say my two favorite authors i love clive barker you know he's someone that i just connected with at a very young age um he seems to kind of explore things that other authors don't, uh, you know, a certain occult or metaphysical things uh, that I kind of latched on to. I uh, love Shirley Jackson. Um, I think she's wonderful. Uh, Richard Matheson, Cormac McCarthy. And there's some newer authors, too, that I, I think are uh, becoming favorites. Uh, Sylvia Moreno-Garcia, uh, Samantha Schweblin. Um, Put out a book somewhat recently, Fever Dream. Uh, it, was, it was excellent. Um, I, I mean, the list the list could go on and on, but those are some of the the main authors that um, you know. Any, I would read any of their work, and I, I always get pleasure out of it. Definitely. So, uh, what do you like to do when you're not writing? Do you have any hobbies or hidden talents? Um, I mainly travel. Uh, when I when I'm able to um, with teaching, you know, it's uh, I'm able to uh, get some time off. So mixing writing with with traveling uh, would probably be the main thing. Um, 
been to almost 70 countries and I don't know, it gives kind of, I love the idea of having that world view and just kind of learning different about different cultures and cuisine and, and, and whatnot. So um, I would say, yeah, writing and traveling. Those, so those are the two main things outside of, uh, outside of work. <laughs> okay. So tell us a little bit about some of the other books you've written. Um, so the first novel, Red Nocturne, um, that's the, the, the spy thriller. Uh, I really enjoyed writing that book and it follows a, a 15 year old girl. Um, she's, uh, she's a violinist and she's trying to get into Juilliard's, uh, pre-college program. So it's the whole book, as you might tell from the title is, is connected with music and, um, they, uh, they live in Boston and, uh, on the third floor, they rent out a room and there's a woman that lives there. Uh, who, you know, the 15-year-old the, the constantly hears her kind of playing piano. So there's this kind of a musical connection. And um, we have the question that comes up, is, is something going on with the woman upstairs? You know, is she more than just a tenant who likes to play piano? You know, is there something nefarious going on? And um, that kind of unravels this uh, this whole spy thing <laughs> and uh what i like about it though is we kind of we get we get to see it through the the kind of the innocent eyes of a 15 year old girl rather than uh what i would say your typical spy uh work is and it's usually through you know an adult's eyes and uh usually somebody in law enforcement or cia or something like that and so i was kind of like this different perspective and uh it was a it was a challenge too um you know, it's the first story that I kind of that I've ever written through the eyes of a uh, of a teenager, and in this case, it being a teenage girl, I, that it it took a lot of research, I think, and I, I can only hope that I that I got it right. And outside of that, uh, most of what I've written uh, be short stories, um, and just a, a wide variety of different uh, horror short stories. Yeah, well, short stories are always fun to write. Um, so what's your next project? What can readers expect from you in the future? Well, um, just finished a draft of uh, the next book. It's uh, apocalyptic horror. Um, and it uh, takes place down south in, uh, in New Orleans. And um, basically, it's uh, what I would probably call religious horror. It's kind of tied in with uh, some of the Christian themes of the apocalypse. And um, it it's a very dark book. It's probably the darkest piece I've written. <laughs> so its tone and, and whatnot will it'll take a major shift, uh, I'd say, from the thing in the wind. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, horror fans like all sorts of, of things, <laughs> dark and, and and not so dark. Okay, so um, I think we'll wrap the interview up here. I'd like to thank you for being our guest today. And please tell everyone where they can find you and your books. Well, uh, I believe the books will be available on uh, Amazon and Crystal Lake uh, Publishing. And I'm found on Facebook. That's, that's about all the social media that I do. <laughs> and I want okay. to thank you for this interview as well. I certainly appreciate, appreciate you reaching out and um, asking some really good questions and giving me the time. Okay. And if you want to check out the thing in the wind, the link is in the description below. And that's it for this episode. Um, bye for now.